recommendation of the superintendent. So um, your um, superintendent will bring you policies. Uh, he'll recommend policies and those policies will, will be discussed and then uh, adopted uh, uh, through usually two meetings uh, into your policy manual. Uh, you are over, you oversee the educational program and you're responsible for acquiring, I'm going to say this several times tonight, reliable information from responsible sources. So it's, it's not rumor bill, it's not rumor control. So when you're making decisions about things, all boards, all board matters, it's getting reliable information from responsible sources. So decisions that you're going to be made. Your superintendent will bring you reliable information. He will use responsible sources, but that's the data that you use to make your, your, your decisions. You, you employ, you employ the staff that the superintendent recommends. Um, you will serve as a quasi judicial um, board uh, at times when personnel issues or student issues bring you to that. And I will break down that, uh, that role and responsibility in a, in a couple of slides. Obviously, you're responsible for uh, approving a budget uh, that is developed by your finance, uh, your business manager and your superintendent um, and preparing a budget that will provide the financial basis for all the things you need to do to support your programs uh, in your schools. Uh, you're responsible for determining, based on the superintendent's recommendation, um, the school facilities needs and for uh, communicating those needs to the local citizens and communication with public and making sure that you're communicating with the public so that they know what you're working on and they know what you're focusing on um, and, uh, and they know what direction, what your goals are, whatever it is you wanna communicate, but communicating with the public is, is very important. And I wanna kind of add a little bit there and I'll say this later on is that uh, your spokesperson for your board is your board chair. So that's the person that communicates with the public uh, that's the person that oversees, that, that coordinates communication with the public. And if there's an emergency, that's the person who will be speaking on behalf of the board. Uh, so we always want to make sure that we have one clear message coming from the board. That comes from your board chair. Um, and once again, a school board and, uh, may exercise all of these powers and responsibilities only when convened in a legally constituted meeting. So once again, the things that I talked about, policy making, budget, finance, hiring, um, communication, uh, budget and, uh, and school facilities, all of these decisions can only ever be made when you're sitting in a legally um, um, uh, constituted meeting. Eileen, could uh, you please yes. specify for us, we have two meetings a month. One is a business meeting, the other is a workshop. At the workshop, we never convene to take votes. We're only discussing a topic or two, right? So if you could just address that, please. I mean, I'm, I assume that is the correct way to go. We are not in a business meeting when we do a workshop. As a board though, you are convened as a board. So therefore it is considered a public meeting. So even if you don't take votes, right. and even if it's just a workshop, that is considered, that is legally considered a board meeting. So you technically have two legal meetings a month. Yes. Now you don't have to have a meeting there where you take where you you just where you have votes, but when that board is together, when you have a quorum of your board at any time, whether it's a workshop or whether it's a board meeting, that is a legally constituted meeting. Great. Yep. Thank you. Okay. In your policy, so you have policy BBA, and for the new board members. Um, you really, and, and your, your policies are very easy to access. You really want to get familiar with your policies, but especially section B. Uh, so at some point you're going to want to go through section B to really get a handle on section B, but your policy BBA, and this is handout two, if you're following the table of contents is really, these are your board powers and responsibilities. So let me stop here and talk about policy. One of the most important things you do is adopt policy. Policy must be followed in its entirety and must be followed at all times. You can't choose to follow a part of a policy. You can't choose not to follow policy. You are legally required to follow the policies that your board has adopted. Now you can change policies. There is a way to do that. But once again, until that's done, you're required to follow your policy. So your policy BBA, it says school board powers and responsibilities. This is what I call your job description. And I think the sentence I wanna read is the board shall concern itself primarily 
with broad questions of policy rather than administrative details. The application of policies is performed by the superintendent. So in other words, your job is to ensure that the schools are well run, but it's your superintendent's job to run the schools. And this gives you um, several um, different parts of your policy. Once again, you enact policy, you select and evaluate uh, and employ the superintendent. Uh, once again, they talk about school facilities. Uh, you talk about developing educational goals. Uh, it talks about the minimum standards for um, school efficient operation uh, and improvement of the school system. Uh, it talks about the requirement uh, and maintaining records and uh, accounts. Uh, these are financial records and accounts. Uh, you approve the budget uh, and financial reports and audits that come before you. You estimate the funds necessary to uh, raise enough taxes for the operation on support and maintenance of your educational system. You adopt courses of study. And this, once again, when you adopt courses of study, it's done with getting re reliable information from responsible sources. That would be your curriculum coordinator or your assistant superintendent. You provide for staff and instructional aids. You evaluate the educational programs based on the data that's brought before you by your superintendent and his staff. Uh, you can approve or disapprove uh, personnel recommendations from the superintendent, and you collaborate with parents and community members and agencies to contribute to the well being of the students. So, this is your policy. This policy was adopted uh, October uh, 1 of 2009. I did reference with our policy uh, archives, it is up to date, even though it was adopted in 2009, it has not changed um, uh, since then. So this is what I call policy BBA, this is your job description. This tells you what you do and what your roles and responsibilities are. So effective boards understand that you have no authority, except when you're acting as part of a, a, a board, or when a board votes by or delegates authority to you. Now, how is that done? So I'll give you an example of negotiations. When you go into negotiations with, uh, with your staff, with your teachers or your support staff to negotiate a new contract, there'll be a negotiating team comprised of board members. So at a board meeting, the board is going to vote to give you authority to negotiate that contract on their behalf. Now you have authority outside of the boardroom. That's a perfect example of when you have authority. And usually during negotiations, they'll give you parameters. We want you to come in between this, this uh, percentage. We want, you to, we want you to address health insurance. We want you to address this language or whatever. They'll give you parameters. They can't pinhole you into you can only do one A, B, or C. They give you parameters to give you that flexibility to negotiate a contract. That's when you have authority. That is the only time you will have any authority over educational matters outside of the boardroom. So that's, once again, really hard concept for sometimes new board members to understand because it's, it's, it's usually most people in the community don't even understand that themselves. So just keep in mind that you have no authority when you're acting as part, um, acting as part of the majority of the, of the board. One of the things I wanna talk about is, so um, how do school boards differ from being a selectman or a legislature? Well, it's, it's actually quite different. And in this, this um, handout, it's handout number three in your table of contents. The second paragraph, it says the main constitution affords control over education to the main legislature. School boards are creatures of statute and their duties and uh, responsibilities are described therein. The next of the concern about school boards responsibly for and responsive to the respective community is part of a decision in a main law court. And it basically says that the school committee acts as a public board. It in no sense represents the town. And this is where this gets gray, gets difficult to understand. Its members are chosen by the voters of the town, but after the election, you are public officers deriving your authority from the law and responsible to the state for the good faith and rectitude of your act. So how did this come about? Well, in 1924, and I know that's a long time ago, there was the Shaw versus Small court case. And what happened is a ward, ward of the state was, was placed with a family in a town in Maine. 
and the family wanted to enroll this child in the school where they lived. And the communities uh, uh, revolted, they rebelled. They did not want this child uh, enrolled. They did not want another ward of the state because it was gonna be too costly. And so the board voted not to enroll the child. Well, if a school board derives their authority through statute, then the statute says that children must attend school in the town where they reside. And so the school board chose the communities. Um, they voted uh, to honor the community's wishes over honoring the law. And the parents took this to court and the decision was overturned. So when it comes down to making decisions, you are required to follow the law first and listen to community members, but they didn't, they don't, they, quite often they'll say, I, you know, I, you'll hear people say, I sent you to, you know, the legislators, I, you know, I, I voted for you and you need to, re re you know, represent and, and respect, you know, my, my thinking and my wishes. What your job is really to do is to make the best decisions you can focusing on the educational programs of the children that you serve. And you must, you must perform your duties in alignment with state statute, uh, not by what the community may want. Because sometimes what the community may want and what state statute says are different. In that situation, you must follow state statute. Um, and so it was explained that once elected, members of a school board function not as a representative of the town or the ward that elects them, in the way that a member of the legislature acts as a representative of his or her district, but as a member of an executive body that oversees the system of public education. So once again, that's also a difficult concept for some people to understand that you don't represent the people that voted you. You actually are a member of a executive body that oversees a public of, uh, system of public education. Does this mean you don't listen to your communities? Absolutely not. It means you do listen and you do bring concerns to the superintendent and the board chair, but at the very end of the day, when you raise your hand to vote, you must make sure that you're following state statute. And I'm gonna pause here because this is where I usually get some questions. Anybody have any questions? Stay elected. I heard so Anybody. How do you stay elected? How do you stay elected? Yep. If you're not voting the way that this, the, the town wants you to vote, you're not you're going to lose your job. Well, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. I haven't seen that many, many times, but um, I think breaking the law um, is, you know, and going against state statute um, is also something that would not be uh, advised. I don't say that, you know, you, if the, the, the town, the town you were, you, were, uh, you were elected to run the school system. So they've given you that power and that authority to run the school system. The only time you really don't listen to the community is when it goes against the law. And so if someone wants you to vote a certain way, you might have to explain that you are required to follow statute. And while you understand that's how they feel, you are required per your policy and by law to follow statute. So maybe that would be a way to explain that I can't vote the way you want me to because that's not, it, it doesn't align with the, the, to the laws and the statutes that you're required to follow. I don't know if that helps, if that answer helps. Actually breaking the law if you vote against it, against the state law, or are you, I mean, some, sometimes when you vote against what, what the state statute is, and you go to court, you actually win, correct? Well, I guess if that's something that the board wants to take on, that would be a decision on behalf of the board. But for the example I gave you, where state law requires that children must attend school in the town where they reside, if if that if you had voted against that, you would be a voting voting against state law. Uh, you would have gotten yes, caught up in probably a legal battle where the parents probably would have gone to court and you would have ended up in court. And I'm not sure that's how the, the, the board wants to spend their time. I have a question. This is a small point. Um, you Earlier you stated that the workshops that RC13, um, this board uh, conducts 
is a public meeting and as such should that be um advertised yes Since it's a public meeting and theoretically open to the public yes okay thank you yep so roles and responsibilities, and I've got a couple, three slides on roles and responsibilities here. Um, once again, the school board sets the big picture. The superintendent works on the operational side. The school board says basically with their decisions, uh, states where you wanna go. The superintendent decides how that work's gonna happen. Uh, you set the vision through performance goals, through your supporting policies, and the superintendent sets the action plan with staff goals and reports of progress. So you provide the resources and you hold the superintendent accountable for that work. If you look at also uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, which I went over your policy, uh, select your superintendent, you set policy, you adopt budget, you act as a court of appeals. You also, once again, we talked about facilities, we talked about uh, educational programs. The superintendent selects staff, uh, then you hire them. Uh, the superintendent recommends and implements policy. Uh, the superintendent will propose and administer a budget. You will vote on that, adopt that budget. And all of the actions that the superintendent takes are going to be based on the policy that you've adopted. So your policy manuals are quite thick and they're quite, they're quite large. And as I said, for the new board members, you really want to take a look at your section B because that really is your job description. And the last slide I have on board superintendent roles, once again, the board sets the vision, the mission, uh, develops goals and adopts policies. And the superintendent um, sets the objectives, the action plans, the regulations and the procedures. So you are, you are the what, you are the end results, and then the superintendent is the means or the how. Uh, and then you make decisions through a vote and the superintendent uh, will then recommend uh, and implement your action. And this takes a lot of trust to communication between the, the school board, trusting that your superintendent is going to carry forward your the decisions that you've made. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, your superintendent, uh, you ensure the schools are well run and your superintendent runs the schools. And I think I see something in the chat. Um, only if you can, uh, this is to me. Um, yeah, uh, so I was asked if there's a difference between a public meeting and a meeting open to the public. So all of your board meetings are public meetings. That being said, and they're open to the public, your board meetings are held for the board to conduct business. Um, and they are to do so in public. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the public can derail your meetings. You, we will go through this in a minute. You do have a public um comment period, we'll go over that policy. Uh, so I will address that uh, in a couple of slides. And if I don't make sure you, you hold my feet to the fire on that one. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we talked about your quasi-judicial role, uh, the three, three primary functions of the board. Legislative, we've really kind of talked about, you adopt policy, uh, make sure you uh, provide for orderly operations of the schools, you know, you make sure you exercise due diligence to make make decisions. Uh, you, you make sure that you get reliable information from responsible sources. That's usually done through the superintendent, bringing people in to do workshops, to do presentations, to provide data on student achievement, um, and then uh, come up with a plan on how you want to move forward. Uh, the executive basically is the ability to off, uh, enter a contract to uh, obviously improve purchases. Um, and you delegate the authority to the superintendent to carry out those functions and obviously uh, uh, establish um, uh, budget uh, spending categories to vote on, on for your budget. Quasi-judicial is when you become judge and jury. And what will happen is there may be a teacher dismissal or a student expulsion. Uh, this is the most common time this would happen. And what will happen is John will be keeping Lauren um, very close to the information at hand. You won't be hearing anything about this because we need to make sure that you're not biased in the process proceedings. And what will happen quite often is that you will become a, a court, uh, a jury, where you will hear the facts of both sides of the case and you'll end up making a decision, which is why you're not given a lot of information as these types of scenarios uh, take place, because we want to make sure that you're not tarnished or you're not biased with information that you shouldn't have had. 
Uh, so that is when you're going to be quasi judicial and that's usually with for your with you folks it's teacher dismissal and student expulsion. Um, once again, um, all the records of the proceedings of the records can be subject to review at the US Supreme Court level. Uh, so um, uh, you have to make sure that you you have not been given information or you don't listen to information prior to the um, prior to the hearings. And I see someone with a hand, but I don't can't see your name. So yeah, that would be me, uh, Carol. Uh, can you talk about how the quasi judicial uh, engagement meetings uh, are or are not open to the public and the public is not privy to the information of those meetings? You're 100% 100, 100 correct. These meetings would take place in executive session. You would go into executive session um, based on a statute that would allow you to go into executive session to protect the identity of the individual that may be subject to the the um, the discussion. Uh, you would you know you would have they might have a lawyer there. You would have your lawyer there. They would present both sides of the of the information. Uh, you would listen. And then you would come out and you would have to make a decision in public session. You can't make decisions in executive session. They have to be done in the public. So you would have to come out and say, um, you know, we are going to suspend Eileen King for so many months and that would be the end of it. You wouldn't give a reason why. Um, or we would expel a student. Um, so John, I don't know if you've had expulsion hearings or not um, that have gone to that, that level, but that's pretty much how they're usually take, uh, done. Yeah, fortunately, we've only had a couple in the eight years that I've been here, right. but that's how we conduct them, obviously. Right. But anything that's going to discuss yeah, a I staff that. member or a student must be done in executive session. Okay. I think we had one of those in the last meeting, and um, I don't think that the portion that should have been in public was actually done in public. So perhaps I'm not recollecting correctly what was done, but I, I, I know that there was an expulsion, I think. The vote, the vote was taken in public. Okay. So is that the portion that needs to be in public, just the yes, vote? Yes, just the vote, mean? just the vote. And, you and, never if it's a student, they re remain anonymous. If it's a teacher that's being dismissed, do they remain anonymous as well? Not through the, not through the, the student, you could keep that anonymous. Uh, the teacher dismissal, uh, that would not be anonymous. Okay, thank you. It would be going into executive session, but if yeah. there was a final vote, that would be, that would be made public. And, you, and you, usually with teacher dismissals, you try you you try to um, there's a lot of work behind the scenes um, before it gets to, to that public setting. Thank you. So, yep. Um, so uh, your policy BDD, uh, which is handout number four, uh, board and superintendent functions and responsibilities. Um, Basically, uh, this policy was adopted once again, April 30th of 2009. Um, the board's exercise of its legislative function through policymaking is its most important responsibility. So once again, you're required by statute to develop policies that you're going to follow. And this, um, this policy that you have adopted says that the management of the schools is the function of the superintendent uh, that you'll respond, recognize the superintendent as the educational leader of a school unit. Uh, you will provide direction for the superintendent through written policies um, and objectives or goals that you've set. You will give the superintendent administrative authority and support for probably discharging of uh, his du professional duties. You will hold all your board meetings in the presence of the superintendent, except as otherwise permitted by law or when the superintendent voluntarily excuses him or him herself. Uh, you will refrain, refer complaints, criticisms, and requests to the superintendent uh, and discuss them at board meetings only after administrative solutions have been exhausted. So if you hear complaints, and I always say to your superintendent and your board chair, 
If you hear complaints, you direct them to the superintendent. It's not your job to take care of them. Let the superintendent and uh, his staff try to come to a resolution. Um, and that's, the, that's their job to do that. It will come to the board only when um, that has not been um, able to, to, be, to uh, be done successfully. And then you evaluate your superintendent and provide appropriate opportunities for the superintendent to evaluate you. You're a team, you all work together and feedback from the superintendent about what's working well with the board and sometimes what's problematic would be very helpful for you in making sure that he, uh, he is able to, to do the job that, that he's required to do. So once again, this is your policy BDD and this is required to be followed. Um, the Can next I ask uh, a question? Sure. Um, and also, I'm sorry, I'm late. I triple booked tonight. Um, are we raising hands or doing like the hand flag on Zoom, which these is easier for you? Just I just can't. speak up, I think. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I can't see you, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, sounds good. And I apologize again for being late. Um, I was curious with BDDB, um, there, the phrase that we um, direct the superintendent through written policies, objectives, and goals. I'm really familiar with the policy piece, but as you were reading it, I realized that I don't have a sense of objectives and goals. And I was wondering if you can give an example of how that happens on a board or if that's through the um, annual review process or if that's something that's more public. Um, usually um, go, um, boards quite often, many boards quite often develop goals uh, to focus on for the year um, based on, so what would, what would usually happen is you would evaluate yourself of a board as a board, uh, evaluate your superintendent. I think it's important for boards to, to conduct self-evaluations of themselves as, as a team. Uh, from those uh, documents, you're gonna just may choose select, we're gonna focus on three goals that you develop as a board. Um, and you're gonna develop some objectives to support those goals. And so that's where that BDD would come in to, to play. So um, you provide direction. So you're gonna have goals, you're gonna have the superintendent, you're gonna ask the superintendent to uh, um, implement a new math curriculum or to revise the math curriculum or the report. You're gonna, get, you're gonna give them a goal and he's going to come up and he's gonna re respond to that goal. He's gonna report back about that goal. Uh, so that's where that comes in. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, let me just jump in. I mean, for John, I think you, Johnny, speak for yourself, but it, you know, my 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 feeling is like when you came, your goal was schools of our future one. Then it became schools of our future two. Right. And then it became COVID. <laughs> it's like pretty clear. Well, you know, the, how let we me just, progressed. Let me just say that the board has in, engaged in goal setting several different times, multiple different times during my tenure. And in different ways, sometimes they we've had uh, board retreats, and then other times it's been part of the evaluation process, and other times it's even been part of the budget process. So the board is really actually engaged in that quite a bit. But COVID, quite frankly, I think the goal has been survival, keep the schools open, right? So, um, you know, one of the things we, we talk about, um, one of the things we talked about earlier was trust and communication, uh, micromanaging, uh, micromanaging, uh, trying to micromanage the board, trying to micromanage the superintendent is not really going to result in an effective, robust educational program. Uh, so we really don't want people focusing on controlling every part, however small of an enterprise. Once again, it's the superintendent's job to run the districts, it's your job to ensure the district is well run. So making sure that you understand your policies and the roles and responsibilities and the functions that we've discussed tonight is very important. Um, as I said, your the policy of your roles and responsibilities, I said, that's your job description. One of the policies I wanna really kind of spend some time on is also your board member code of ethics. And this would be handout number six in the, in the document of the handouts. Uh, you adopted this policy uh, April 3rd of 2014. Um, there are 20 different uh, parts of this policy. Um, having uh, basically, uh, this is uh, how you are expected to conduct and to hold yourselves during board meetings. Um, that you, know, you see the serving on the board as an opportunity to serve your community and your state. Uh, you will think of children first. Uh, uh, and base your decision on how it will affect children. 
Uh, children are your number one priority. Uh, and that's why you've been elected and that's why you're serving and is to, to think of children and base your decision on how it will affect children and their education. Uh, you will make no disparaging marks in or out of board meetings about other members. Uh, and you'll remember that you have no legal authority outside of meetings. Um, and that as an, um, uh, that uh, you'll understand that the board and vice chair have empowered uh, that they, uh, they run the board meetings. Your board chair will run the board meetings. Uh, it's your, we recognize it's you're not, not your responsibility to operate the schools, but to see that they're well operated. You'll seek to provide education for all children in the community, regardless of their needs and their abilities. And I'm going to say it, you know, that's a nice way of saying their cost. Um, and uh, you will listen to citizens, but you'll refer all your complaints to the proper authorities. In this case, it would be the board chair and the superintendent and uh, let them uh, let the superintendent uh, conduct his job in, in addressing those concerns. Uh, number 10 is really important. You will support graciously once it has been made, a decision once it's been made by the majority of the board. So what uh, a high functioning board will, you'll see uh, from a high functioning board is that you're going to have a discussion, you're going to make a decision. Um, sometimes decisions are not all, you know, not everyone agrees. But once that decision's made, your job is to ensure that ever, whatever the vote was, your job is to support the superintendent and, and carrying out that vote as successfully as possible, even if you disagree. Going out in the community saying, I didn't agree, I voted against it, I didn't want this to happen, that doesn't accomplish anything. It actually makes you look like a very fractured, very splintered board. So when this board um, really begins to work well as a team is when you can agree to disagree. And at the end of the day, you will support any decision that's been made by the board graciously, and you'll be supportive of the direction it's going in uh, as, as a member of the as a board team. Um, you'll make decisions only after all the facts bearing on a question were presented and discussed. So if you hear something in Hannaford, put it aside. Uh, you're going to make your decisions based on what you hear in the boardroom. You can ask good questions. You, that's your job is to ask good questions, but you must make your decisions only when you've heard all the facts that have been presented. Um, and if the community uh, asks you to promise how you're going to vote, you can't do that because once again, your policy says you can't. And number two, you haven't heard all the facts in the boardroom. So please don't make any promises about how you're going to vote on a matter that's going to come before a, a, board, uh, a, a board meeting. Um, you won't discuss confidential business of the board, especially anything in executive session is confidential and that's confidential forever. It's not just while you're on the board, it's not just during a school year, it is confidential forever. Uh, you will uh, confine your board action to policymaking and planning, uh, leaving the administration of schools to the superintendent. Uh, you will uh, make sure that the schools have adequate finance uh, to uh, actually support the children and the programs that you have in place. Um, and there's a couple, uh, resist every temptation outside pressure to use your position as a board member to benefit yourself or individuals so you're, or, or, uh, or any agency um, uh, so you can't gain financially from being on the board. Uh, You'll endeavor to attend every regular special emergency board meeting uh, uh, and all the standing committees that which are appointed. Um, and you'll recognize at all times that the school board is an agent of the state. And as such, I will abide by the laws of the state and the regulations formulated by the main department of education and the main school board and the state board of education. Now, your policy has a place where it's signed and it's dated. John, are you having uh, board members sign and date this policy? Is that a, is that a requirement? Uh, I, we've never done it, but. Okay. Um, it, there is a place to sign. There is a place to date. Many boards do ask their board members to sign and date the board member code of ethics. You are required to follow it. Basically, it, it, it says that you've reviewed your code of ethics, it reviews what you can and cannot do. Um, so this is your policy BCA. So this really spells out your board member code of ethics and how you'll conduct yourselves. Um, so that is in your handouts, in your in your policy. So yeah, ethics, yep, go ahead. Um, with regards to ethics, um, where the bullet uh, seek regular communications, 
is that amongst each other for, uh, with the superintendent or with our community members? Could you describe that a little bit more? It's seeking regular communications. Um, you know, your job is not to go out and poll community members, but if community members come to you, you want to make sure that you communicate that conversation or those concerns with your school board. If you have a question about, you know, things uh, on agenda items, I'd definitely say you're going to want to communicate, you're going to want to seek communication with your superintendent. Um, and Communicating with each other outside of board meetings is dangerous because that could become a quorum and it could be perceived that you are conducting business outside of the public and you don't want to have that happen. So you do want to seek communications when you have questions about items, but you want to make sure that you don't do so in a manner that's going to engage in public comment outside of the board meeting. Thank you. Yep. Eileen, is it three or more board members constitute a quorum outside of how many uh, board members meeting. do you have in total? 10, 10. Um, I think it's, I'm going to have to check on that, Lauren. It's either three or four. I think it's three. Like, it's three. If, if three of us were to have coffee, because we felt like it, I mean, I've always thought we shouldn't do that. Two people can have coffee, but three people, eh. It, it, and that's hard. It's hard because you don't want to be seen as a quorum because people may assume that you are having board business outside. Right. right. So um, I will confirm that it's three for you. Okay. Um, but um, you have to be very careful how you convene outside in public uh, because that has created a, a lot of headaches for other boards when, um, especially when a, a board makes a decision that's not popular and three or more board members were seen having lunch or having you know, coffee together, that immediately becomes, well, they were talking about it, even though you weren't, um, that immediately becomes a, per a perspective or a perception that you, that you don't wanna make sure, that you wanna make sure it doesn't happen. Right, and the only uh, difference is a personnel committee. We always meet privately. We do not meet publicly. That would be appropriate. Yeah. Does that does the personnel committee still require public notice or at least board notice? I would say to cover your, I would say I would, I would definitely uh, provide notice because you're going to, it is a personnel and that would be discussing um, personnel issues. So yes, provide notice of meeting, but not public meeting. It's not a public meeting. Okay. Got it. Ethics and practice, um, we represent, you represent the entire district when making decisions, the entire district. You understand the role of the board, that you are a team that works together to, in the, in the interest of providing the educational programs for your students. You think of your students first and you are there for students. You encourage an open exchange of ideas at board meetings. Uh, once again, seek regular communications. You see, you ask questions, you, you uh, follow up, you uh, ask for data. Uh, keep in mind uh, the superintendent works for all of you, so you don't want to um, encumber the superintendent with uh, requests, um, data that for, requests for data to the superintendent should come from the board level, not from individual board members. If we had 10 board members requesting individual information from your superintendent, he would never have time to, to do his job. So any data that gets requested from the superintendent should come at a board meeting from the entire board. Uh, on the we'll, other uh, hand, on the other hand, I recommend to every board member, if you have a question of John, call him. Go ahead, call him. He's there to listen to you if you need to ask him a question or two. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Um, I've just seen superintendents get inundated with people just constantly asking them, you know, for a lot of data. Um, yeah. So that type of data preparation takes time. So that really yeah. should come from the entire board. Yep. Uh, the board meeting. I'm not saying, I'm certainly, certainly not saying call, don't call John. Um, call him. I agree with Lauren. Yep. Call him. <laughs> yep. uh, work with other board members in a conscientious and courteous manner. Avoid conflicts of interest. Once again, you're going to agree to disagree, uh, but um, that should not impede the functionality of your of the team, the, of the, the board team. Um, the duties of the chair are a little bit different. The, the chair of, this, of the school board and the superintendent um, do work closer together, uh, do work closely together. And, and my role as superintendent, my board chair was my sounding board. Uh, he was a person I would call up and say, 
just want to give you a heads up. This is what I'm dealing with today. And, and you know, we would usually talk about when are we going to let the board know. These were non-emergency discussions, that type of thing. Um, I uh, would quite often run things by him um, because the superintendent's position is very lonely. And that was someone that I could pick up the phone and talk to to help sometimes plan what I was thinking and were there kind of what do you think conversations. Um, so there were times that this, the board chair had a little bit more information than the rest of the board. Uh, however, at the very end of the day, you would end up with a presentation on something that I discussed with the board chair that he just helped me kind of form my thinking. Uh, the duties of the chair, will, he will chair school committee meetings um, and he will set assist in the setting uh, a setting schedule for meetings, workshops, uh, special meetings in conjunction with the superintendent and unless otherwise agreed upon, which I mentioned is the official spokespersons for the school committee. So if there is a time where there is an emergency and we need to have a statement coming out of the out of the school district it will either come from your superintendent and or your board chair. And what I usually recommend at this point is that a joint statement would be crafted between uh, John and Lauren um, and that uh, you would know what it says, but you would not be the person sharing this information. So if people in an emergency, your board chair and your superintendent would be making sure that the accurate informata, information and data is being shared publicly. So that's quite often, um, uh, quite often the role of the board chair. Um, the voice, however, of the chair is not the de facto opinion of the board. So, you know, he doesn't have any stronger vote. He doesn't have a more important opinion. Uh, he remains an equal member of the team uh, with the same voting authority that you have. And the decisions of the board need to be made by the entire board. And so the duties of the chair is more of the leader. I call the team builder. Uh, if someone's not following policy, uh, Lauren would be the person just to you know do a, a, a very polite little phone call on the side saying you know don't forget we have that code of ethics policy I'm not sure that you meant to you know that that you you meant to go against that but we need to make sure that you are all following policy state law and statute and that that is your board chair's role and responsibility. Um, the next two slot uh, these are in your handout seven uh, this is handout seven. And I'm not going to go through these a lot, but this is something when you get back into meeting in person, I call these next two slides, what I call them is the placemat. And what I did when I was superintendent is I laminated them and they were placed in everyone's position uh, at your seat at a board meeting. When you were meeting in person, you know, you had your board, your table and your name plaques and everyone would have this laminated um, what I call a placemat that includes the Roberts Rules of Order motions chart. Um, and this, the motions below, um, you know, they give you about uh, what you want, what you say. Uh, do you need a second? Uh, can you debate it? Can you amend it? Uh, how, how does the vote come out? Um, and it also talks about what does, uh, what role the superintendent play during board meetings. It just has some kind of like, you know, crib notes on the side. Um, and, uh, the second part of this is has, oh, look, your code of ethics. There it is, a reminder on uh, your code of ethics uh, for school board members. And it also kind of talks about um, some of the um, questions you can ask. Uh, what impact will the decision have on students? How will this decision help us reach our goals? Uh, do data and research support the decision? Are you using data? Uh, what supports? So they, I'm not going to read them through you, but also it talks about board meeting evaluation. Uh, did we spend our time on what matters most? Did all board members have an opportunity to be heard? So we want to make sure that all board members have a voice at, at board meetings and that one person is not dominating or manipulating the conversation. Uh, did we have adequate, ad adequate information? Uh, do we, did we consider the expertise of the staff of our district? Um, and so there's just some really good questions here. So this is what I call the placemat when you're back meeting in person. Uh, this is a great little asset, a great little tool to have at your fingertips. Uh, most importantly, the code of ethics should be front and center uh, as, as you function as a school board. What are the most common protocol mistakes boards make is not understanding what the, the board, the chair's role is. Uh, quite often people will say, well, why did the board chair know about that before we did? And because that is quite often how those conversations happen. Once again, I'd call Larry and I say, this is what's going on. 
Uh, Larry and I would talk about what my what my next steps were, and then he and I would decide how are we going to communicate this with the rest of the board so they know what's going on. Uh, I tend to like the telephone <laughs> over email because email can take a life of its own. Uh, quite often, Larry and I would divide and conquer, um, or I'd ask my secretary to pick up the phone and call the board uh, board members to let them know that we're dealing with the situation, uh, that everything's under control. But I want to make sure they heard it from me or from someone that they trusted before they heard it on the street. Another common protocol uh, mistake is allowing surprises. If you know someone's coming to the board meeting and you know they're angry about something or they have an issue, um, let the superintendent know. Um, just give them a heads up because if the, the if that if the superintendent has time to look into something, uh, quite often they can maybe put the the you know address the issue and 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 not uh, let it escalate to a level that it doesn't need to. So that's always very helpful. Um, Lauren should be requiring recognition from everyone prior to speaking, even on Zoom. Uh, we need to demand proper respect and protocol by all board members at all times, uh, even during difficult discussions, and even when you have to agree to disagree. Um, and forgetting that the conduct of the board during meetings sends messages to the public. Um, this is really, really important. As a teacher and as a principal, I worked with high, high functioning boards that worked very, very well together, and I worked with boards that were very splintered. Um, the culture that you establish at the board level really is reflected in your schools and reflected in your in your classrooms. Uh, so if 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 the if the uh, if you really establish a high functioning culture at the board level, that trickles down into your schools. However, if you if you become splintered and divisive and disagreeable, that just that sets for a very uncomfortable culture. Uh, because you almost feel like you're walking on eggshells. The teachers don't know what's going on. The principals don't know what's going on. I could tell you as a principal, I knew when my superintendent was facing a really tough meeting uh, and it was a tough board because I could tell by that furrowed brow <laughs> that, um, that I might see or even, my, or even when I was a teacher and my principal. Um, and so really this, the culture that you establish at your board is, is the culture that's going to be predominant in your school district. Uh, once again, this is what I just talked about is trust within your community, how you conduct yourself and your business in the public eye goes a long way in determining your credibility and support in the community. And once again, you are overseeing your community's most precious resource. And that's the children in your the towns that 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 um, that form RSU 13. Uh, so your community wants to see a board that's working well, that's focused on what's best for students, that's focused on the educational programs because they they want their children to get the best education they can. Uh, so how you conduct yourselves, how you hold conversations, how you speak about each other, which you shouldn't be doing outside of board meetings, but that that really defines you as a board and. Uh, and I think, I think the people in your community, especially your parents, want to make sure that um, you're, you're spending your time focusing on what's best for their children. So a word about email, and I'm someday, I always say this in my presentation, someday I'm going to get that Ghostbusters with the, with the ghost of the red line in it. Just don't. Um, just don't. Um, email is, is great for announcing that a meeting's going to take place on November 22nd via Zoom to do a MSMA board workshop. Um, but it is not a substitute for deliberations at board meetings and for communications and for any business that should be confined to board meetings. You should be aware that your email and email attachments can become part of your public records uh, and may be ins inspected by any person upon request. Um, you do have a policy BEA. Um, and that is uh, school board use of electronic email. And it says it will not use email as a substitute for deliberations at board meetings or for other communication or bu business properly confined to board meetings. Uh, board members shall be aware that email and email attachments are uh, public for, uh, are, are, um, may be a request, as I said, to regard as public records and may be in inspected. And board members shall avoid reference to confidential information about employees, students, or other matters in emails. I just think the safest thing for board members is not to use email. 
Uh, you're going to get maybe your agendas via email. You're going to get your attachments via email. But responding to board business on email is, is, is completely unacceptable. Um, and it goes against Maine's public meeting law. So I just say, just don't. Email is a great organizational tool about um, when we're going to meet and what time we're going to meet or um, something like that. So please make sure you, you, um, you, don't, um, you don't use email for anything other than that. I did include some social media guidelines. Uh, once again, if you're going to be on social media, uh, make sure that you clarify that uh, this, is, uh, you're, you're, this is as a private citizen, uh, that you're not uh, on social media as a member of the board because once again, you have no authority. Uh, do not talk about school district business, um, you know, on social media, uh, unless it's something positive, like, well, I saw the beginner band concert last week. That was wonderful. So if you want to promote something, you know, something you saw positive, that's obviously appropriate. Um, you want to avoid posting content that indicates that you've formed an, an opinion on a matter. You just want use and social media. Once again, just don't. If you have a, a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter account, that is your private account. Please do not use that account to discuss school business because it will see people will perceive that you have authority, which you don't. And school business should only be discussed in, in, the, in the boardroom. So um, I, did, I did add some more things about social media. And I'll stop and see if there are any questions on the use of social media and emails. Okay, get myself organized here. Um, confidentiality is the next topic I wanna to talk about. And um, 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 there are two things I'm gonna talk about confidentiality. Um, is one is uh, what is considered confidential, anything, employment is considered confidential. Applicants, interviews, reference information, that's all confidential. If you happen to serve on an interview committee um, and you're part of a discussion about hiring a staff member um, and you see that information, that is always, always confidential. Everything in executive session, all executive session information is confidential. So anything you discuss in executive session is considered confidential forever and ever and ever. And once again, as we talked earlier, quasi-judicial matters, when you're talking about a teacher or student expulsion, once again, that's confidential information. So what is executive session? Executive session is when you are allowed by law to go into a private session not the board can meet privately, not in public, uh, to discuss a variety of, 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 of items. Um, this could be discussion or consideration of employment, appointment, assignment, uh, once again, promotion, demotion, I won't read them all, compensation, evaluation, discipline, any type of discussion about personnel, once again, students, or, or something that would, so let's say you are um, looking at buying a piece of property to build a school. If that discussion in public session gave someone else an upper hand. So let's say um, you were gonna direct the superintendent to call and, and to put a bid on a piece of property. If that discussion was held in public, someone who else who might be thinking about buying that property, that would give them an upper hand. So that could be discussed in obviously an executive session. Also legal um, issues uh, um, can also be discussed in, in, in executive session. So once again, expulsion. So I've gone through and personnel is number one, uh, really. Uh, expulsion or suspension of a student is number two. And then condition or acquisition or use of a real or personal property only if premature disclosure would prejudice the competitive or bargaining of that body or agency. General budget matters are not discussed at all. Question. Yeah, and I have, um, my question is, can new board members know what happened in a previous executive session? No, unless the previous, unless the executive session, I don't, let me think about this one, um, unless the previous, ex unless the, the executive session is dealing with an issue of a previous executive session. So let's, so let me, you, let me give you a quick example. 
we uh, we approve we uh, discuss budgets uh, our, our our budgets in executive session before well, we did not budgets we discuss say teacher contract in executive session uh, would ongoing I mean the next time you have a teacher contract the new board members should know what happened to the on the previous executive session around the contract in what way well you you have a strategy you have areas where you uh, of issues you were trying to get to and you may not have gotten to but you might now you may want to get to them again and you may want to let people know why you didn't get there and that would all be in an executive session um that's a really good point and i think that that point you could discuss that if it's a strategy that you're going to use moving forward I, I personally think that a, bo a board member should never be hidden, uh, that information should never be hidden from a board member. And if you're not going to allow people to know what happened in the previous executive sessions, there are always issues that can, can be ongoing from those. I think so. if you were to say, if you're in executive session saying, these are the things we want to, that we want the, the negotiating team to focus on um, and we want to see if we can get a more competitive rate on our health insurance, or we want to renegotiate health insurance. Um, and that's something that you're, you're going to employ again. I think that would be fair to say we did try this last time and we weren't successful. So we're going to try it again. I think that is a permissive subject of executive session. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Not really. It, it sort of skirts the question. Okay. And I don't mean to, I just know that ex content in executive sessions are highly confidential. So I'll yes. tell you what, let me, let me, let me look into this um, because I see your point and I agree with your point that you shouldn't be left flat footed. You shouldn't be hit with something that happened. So the teachers all know what happened last time, but you're a new board member and you don't. But so let me, let, this is a good question. Let me research it and I'll get back to Lauren and make sure he gets back to you. Eileen, Maria, would it be fair in this situation that if you're being asked to vote on something that was discussed in executive session and you don't have all the facts because of confidentiality, et cetera, you can either abstain or vote against because of lack of facts and data that would be pertinent to uh, your vote? Well, if you're in executive session, you should have, except from this one example that this gentleman, and I, I, sir, I don't have, I can't see you, so I don't know what your name is. Um, Dave. Laura, D Doug. Except Dave, for Dave, this, Dave. Dave, I'm sorry. This is, except for this one um, example that Dave has brought forward, which is an outstanding example um, that I will research, Dave, to get back to you. Anything else, you should have all the data in executive session for you to come out uh, because you're going to have to take a vote. If you do take a vote, sometimes you don't. Sometimes executive sessions are informational. But if you do have to take a vote, you should have all the data in executive session to come out and take a vote, either yay or nay. Well, sometimes executive sessions are continuing. And like I say, right now we have two new board members. If we had one, and we, I don't believe we do, but if we had an executive session that was continuing, they would be required they would need to know everything that happened in those previous executive sessions. Say if they come in, the, again, I'll go back to the vote. Say they had come in the middle of a discussions on a uh, contract. They would be, they would need to know all the discussions that, pre, that uh, occurred prior to that. And I agree with you. Um, I don't wanna give you bad advice. So let me just research this tomorrow and I will get back to Lauren. Sounds good. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to say something here. Um, it's worthwhile note, noting that um, there is no note taking or recording of executive sessions. So all the information that would come forward to a new bo board member would be like a general outline of what happened. The, there would not be the details there because it is not legal to take notes or make recordings of executive sessions. Correct, there are no notes, there are no handouts. There is a discussion. There are, there are no notes, there are no, no handouts. 
No. I believe an executive session needs to have notes because of this. And they need to be, they obviously need to be under lock and key. They do, is it Maine's law that we cannot take notes on executive session or is it just a, uh, is it just local policy that you don't take, make? I, it's, it is law that there are no notes kept during executive session. Is that, real problem is that individual that? notes or is that notes? No, no, that would be an official notes. record. I'm sorry? There, there, there is no individual notes or no records kept of executive session. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Does that include student expulsions? Yes. So the, so the district can't keep notes on, the expo, uh, on, on what happened in the executive session when a student's being expelled. Well, the uh, superintendent uh, will have probably developed a, a, with their lawyer. The lawyer is going to have notes. But, but and without having, without having an, a, 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 a copy of what was presented to the board, you got a real problem. No, you don't. Yes, you do because you may you you may have you may not have the the in this case uh, the, the 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 superintendent and don't take this wrong, John. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> um, may not have presented the board with its entire case, or may the have lawyer, may, lawyer, or may have and may have had inaccuracies in its case. So you're going to serve in this situation. You're going to serve as a court. Uh, a jury, you're going to listen to both sides and you're going to make a decision. You yes. cannot have notes. Your lawyer is going to have the notes. Every, they every will court, them. every court has notes. You, as a board member, you it's may illegal, not. It's illegal in Maine to take notes at a executive session or is it local policy? I, I will get you the statute for that. I'll get you the statute. Okay, we can move on now. Thank you. Okay. Um, once again, executive session starts with a public motion. Uh, it will pass with a uh, pass uh, passes a motion with a recorded vote of three fifths members present and voting, and you must state the precise nature of business in your motion, including and citation from the statute. Uh, those uh, statute citations are in your handouts, and I believe that is handout number 12. It will give you uh, the reasons you go into executive session. It will give you the statute. So you are required to state the precise nature of the business without obviously names and then include the citation from statute. Can, Only you, give a, can you give an example of that? Because I think we usually cite the statute. Only. Um, yep. So demotion. So if you want to, if you're going to discipline an, an employee, it would be statute MRSA 405 6A. If you're going to discuss expulsion of students, it would be MRSA 405 6B. Uh, if you're going to investigate charges against someone, it would be statute MRSA 405 I think um, I misunderstood. I guess I, so you only have to state, cite the relevant statute. You don't have to say statute plot in order to discuss the teacher, whatever. You can, you can say the reason for executive session is to investigate complaints against a person and that statute citation is MRSA. You don't have to give the, the precise reason, but you at least have to talk about this, the citation. Can I also make the point that when we have two things to consider, we go in, we consider that thing, then we come out, then we go back in to consider the next one. And we do that, then we come out. And that's, and that's the way, Lauren, it should be done. It should be done per statute and per, per topic. Um, no official actions uh, shall be finally approved in executive session and no public record shall be kept of executive session. Uh, I'll make sure you get the statute for that. I agree with the no public record. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's executive session. Uh, and uh, but keeping notes would be considered if you're if they're not. Well, I'll, I'll get you the statute. Um, so um, one of the things we talked about was uh, public concerns and complaints, um, and. Uh, you have a policy for this, for public concerns and complaints. It's policy KE. Uh, that would be handout 13 in your packet. 
Um, and basically it is that uh, parents, students, or the citizens with complaints or concerns uh, regarding uh, RSU 13 uh, shall be encouraged to seek a resolution at the lowest possible level. So if someone comes to you and they have a concern about someone, you wanna make sure that they talk to the teacher. Actually, you, you just say, you know, did you talk to the teacher? And if not, I'll bring this to the superintendent. So thank them for, for bringing you the concern. Thank you for letting me know. I have no authority uh, to deal with this outside of the boardroom. And we have a policy that says we wanna, we wanna resolve it at the lowest possible level. Make sure you call your superintendent, make sure you share what, you, what concern you've heard and then let the superintendent address it. Um, and then if the complaint is not resolved at any lower level, it can be appealed once again to the superintendent. Um, and at that point, um, if it needs to get placed on an agenda, it will. And if it gets to that level, that would be held in executive session, whatever that discussion would be. So that's where your public complaint. So this basically says the same thing. You seek resolution at the lowest possible level. If not resolved, appeal the decision to the next level. If it's still not involved, it can go to the superintendent. And if it's still not involved, it can be placed on the board agenda. Um, you That would be the parent or the person complaining that would not be you placing it on the board agenda. It would be the person that, that doesn't feel has been brought to a resolution. And then once again, that would go before, uh, the, that would 99% go into executive session because it will probably be dealing with a student or with an employee of the district. And those items cannot be discussed in public session. Eileen, I have a question on this one. If the, my understanding is the member of the public, whoever that may be, if they're not um, satisfied with the superintendent's resolution, they can ask the board chair to place the item on the agenda. Is it within the purview of the board chair to decide if the item will go on the agenda or does it have to go on the agenda? No, that's, that's in your policy. The, the, after uh, the superintendent, after co in consultation with the school committee chair, shall determine whether yeah. the complaint will be placed on the ad agenda. So it's jointly between the superintendent and the board chair. Correct. And Thank that's you. per your policy that was adopted October 1st, 2015. So this is one of those things where you have to, you know, you're following policy and you'll have to follow policy in this situation. Um, so that's uh, how you discuss, that's how you handle the concerns and complaints. Um, something else I want to also talk to you about is the um, public participation. Um, and um, you have, once again, policy BEHD uh, was in your policy manual. And this was adopted October 7th of 2010. Um, in LD 721 uh, was passed, and it basically requires public, public comment period. And uh, the language of the law says a school board shall provide the opportunity for the public to comment on school and education matters at a school board meeting. Nothing in the subsection restricts the school board from establishing reasonable standards for public comment period. You can establish time limit, limits, you can establish conduct standards. Um, and then for public, for purposes, school board meetings means a full meeting of the school board. It does not include subcommittee meetings. Um, there's a really good paragraph in this policy that you have. And I think it's something that, that you should, should remember that um, regular special and emergency meetings of the board are always open to the public. Board meetings are conducted for the purpose of carrying on the official business of, school, of the school system. The meetings are not public forum meetings, but are meetings which are held for the board to do its business in public. So it's not the public, it's not a public, it's not the public's meeting. It's not a public forum. It is a meeting that the board must hold in public to invest its business. It does give time, it does give opportunity for people to um, have public comment, but the minutes um, uh, but it but it doesn't mean that this is a public forum. Lauren, I mean to be to be clear on this. So we've always limited public comment to the agenda. Uh, and RSU 13, especially since I've been chair. So is that something that we can do, we can't do? We can decide if we can do it differently and decide later what we wanna do. But in terms of statute or law, what, is, what does it tell us about that? 
Your policy says the board will provide appropriate opportunities for citizens to express interests and concerns related to the matters under consideration. The public is cordially invited to attend and participate in meetings. Um, there is a quite a debate among the lawyers and um, school board members and superintendents when this policy came out. If you look at the policy, the board shall provide the opportunity for the public to comment on school and education matters. It doesn't say that's on the agenda. So technically per this law, people can come and express um, comment, public comment on school and education matters, even if they're not on the agenda. That being said, you are not required to respond to them. You are required to give them the opportunity to make comment. And you might say- it, they have, Right. Does it relate to what we perceive as RSU 13 educational matters or yes. any? I would say, yeah, on, on, I, yeah, I would say it's your district educational matters. Right. So but someone it, brought up stuff from, let's say, Oklahoma. I mean, uh, that doesn't necessarily be something we need to provide comment, public comment time for. It'd be it, something related to RSU 13 education related, students. Related to RSU 13. Hmm. Okay. Um, you can put in time constraints. You can say you yeah. have two minutes to speak. At yeah. the end, you are not required to answer. You're not required to take action. Um, depending, Lauren, on what the comment is, it will be your decision to say, thank you for bringing that up. And I think I will ask the superintendent to look into this and we'll put it on our next agenda. Or thank you for bringing it up and move on to the next person. Yeah, thank you. So yeah. you are required to allow public to comment, but this is not a community forum. This is not a public forum where your meetings can get hijacked. Okay. Uh, your meetings are required to be held in public for you to conduct your business. And it's yeah. the meeting of the business of the board. So, so you okay. also do have your policy BEHD as well. Actually, can I ask two clarifying questions there? Sure. One is just, I was looking at this policy, the, the sample policy that you guys send out. And am I correct that you guys actually do not recommend that we limit um, <clears throat> the uh, limit items to the agenda because you, you're concerned about legal implications for the statute. Is that still um, the policy you guys have? Yeah, the, the, actually, the lawyers actually said that if you look at this law, 720, LD 721, it says you will provide opportunity for the public to comment on school and education matters. It does not say that are on the agenda. Okay. And my second question is, I was trying to find this in the state statute and I couldn't really... But for does the public is that limited to people in our district or is public how how is public actually defined in the statute? Um, it it's not it, it is not limited to people in your district, which we all believed it was. Um, and it it can have it, people can come in um, and make comment. Um, however, what I would do if I were Lauren is I would ask them to ask. Um, I would ask them to uh, um, introduce themselves. And I would ask them to uh, uh, state the town in which they live in. Um, but it does not, and um, I can double check this for you, Lauren, but it does not, it does not limit public comment to just your, your residents. And, and it's not something we can make in policy. That this, we will follow statute, obviously. So the statute says anybody can come, anybody from France, you know. Well, and this and is what's hard because it says the opportunity for the public yeah. And, but it doesn't say the public that resides in your community. So the, and once again, the statute was poorly, this law was poorly written yeah. because it didn't provide that clarification. Now you mm -hmm. could say in your policy, we'd like to listen to members from our community first. Okay. Um, okay. And, and then any other, you know, if, if, you know, something else, if, if something hasn't been said, you know, and, and invite other people to, to make comment. But um, definitely, I would I would certainly want to know who's making the comment and where they live. Um, so, but for many many years, it was assumed that public meant just the public in your community. And for many years, uh, it took a while for this law to get clarified that public comment meant it had to be tied to the agenda. And those are not uh, act those are not accurate perceptions. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Along the same lines, I'm wondering if we can allocate specific amounts of time um, to people depending upon where they're from, or, or do we have to set that in advance? How does that work? 
I think you'd want to re revisit your policy. Um, I think you'd want to say that members, I mean, um, you know, De John, I'd definitely make sure that you have some legal counsel on this, but I would definitely revisit our policy and, and maybe establish a procedure where members from the communities of the, of the towns that, that form RSU 13 will speak first and anyone else from outside the community will have to wait until they're done. Actually up for policy committee consideration next month because of this very reason. Yeah, all speakers in your policy right now, all um, the chair will require persons uh, interested in speaking to sign up. All speakers must identify themselves as they begin talking. Uh, the chair has the authority to stop any presentation which violates the public participation guidelines. Um, you know, you've got, you're, it's quite comprehensive, but I would definitely um, say that if you want to make sure you know, and it also talks about the board shall provide appropriate opportunities for citizens to express interests and concerns. It doesn't say citizens who reside in our town. So that would be something you'd have to clarify. So it's, it's pretty open-ended there. Is that legal to say anymore? What's legal to legal, say? Citizens. Well, that's what your policy well, says. Is, I mean, that. is that is it is it is that a legally correct thing to say anymore? I think residents would be better. I I oh. don't have an answer to that question. I'm just. You mean residents instead of citizens? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I don't know if you could say residents. I think that's something you're going to have to vet with the lawyers. That I don't hmm. know. Okay. Because residents would then confine public comment just to people that reside in your district. Yeah. Um, it, it would go into violation with LD 721, where it says opportunity for the public, which doesn't define that. Okay. So I think that's something you're going to have to vet with that. Eileen, okay. thank you for exploring this topic as well as you have. Uh, I'm afraid that I've been the impetus for it in the last board meeting, but I really appreciate your clarifying comments. And I see Lauren smiling there. No, I think it's great to get clarifying full clarity comments. in this. It just feels better to me to be really clear altogether on what the law is and what our policy needs to be. It's all great. Um, and I'm thinking that this policy may, John, this policy, you may want to look at updating because I think this policy was adopted before this law got passed. Yep. So again, and I think pretty much everybody, but the really new board members know this, the policy committee is engaged in going through all of the policies, um, any policy 2009 and prior certainly, but also policies after that and updating and this policy was actually already in the queue for that. So it's, it's we're doing that. It's gonna take some time, but we are doing it. Yeah, it's a good policy. I just, um, I just looked at the date and then I remembered um, when this got, when LD721 got passed. So um, um, I think I can send you a sample, John, that I have. Um, that so instead of reinventing the wheel, I'll send you the, the that we developed after this law got passed. So I'll make sure I do that tomorrow. So six key attributes of board members. Uh, once again, to think strategically and analytically. Um, you know, effectively communicate your thoughts on why you're taking a stand. Uh, earned respect. Uh, you know, earn the respect of your key st uh, key stakeholder group members. Work well with others. Um, obviously, as a member of a collaborative group, you are a team. Uh, you're not, uh, there's, there, and there's no I in team. Uh, so working together for the good of the children in your district. Uh, make sure you understand the difference between oversight and supervision, or maybe that's a nice word for saying micromanaging. Uh, earn the reputation for uh, personal integrity, uh, honesty, um, and emotional maturity when things don't go your way. Uh, and have a demonstrated familiarity with the body of knowledge related to both the process for which the group is responsible as, as, as well as the substantive content of the subject area in which decisions are being made. Um, there are four actions that matter for school board members, uh, the positive relationship with effective boardsmanship and student achievement. 
is responsible school government, high student expe expectations, holding the district accountable, uh, community engagement, and creating conditions for the student and staff uh, success. Uh, so I've uh, also included the eight traits for uh, highly effective school boards. That's in your handout number 15. So all of these uh, eight bullets have a little bit of a background uh, to them that you might want to take, take a look at. But high achieving boards have high expectations and clear goals. They believe that all children can learn. You focus on achievement. Uh, you're collaborative. Uh, you communicate well. You use data to make your decisions. Uh, your goals and your re resources are aligned. Uh, you have team leadership uh, and team training is something that we're doing today. And then I did include your evaluation um, handout 16. I did include a sample board of self-evaluation. This might be something you might wanna take a look at. Um, why would you wanna evaluate? Uh, really it's to give you uh, a, uh, the opportunity to look at how you're conducting business, uh, how you're um, you know, following your policies um, and um, you're gonna evaluate yourself as a whole. Uh, you're gonna look at your strengths. You're gonna look at areas that you need to improve. Um, and uh, once again, you're gonna ask your, you should be asking your superintendent for feedback is, as well. Um, so this is something you might wanna consider. If you do consider doing a board evaluation, we do have some sample evaluation uh, documents that other school boards have used that we'd be happy to send out. So with that being said, um, do you have any questions? And I'll stop my share so I can see everyone. I'll just jump in, Eileen, and say thank you so much. It's a wonderful presentation. We really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's just great timing for us and uh, love your professionalism and your skill and what you bring to this. Thank you so much. Well, I'm not done yet. You're not done yet? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm I thought you were presenting. done. No, I'm done presenting. <laughs> so I know what that. are your, what are your big takeaways tonight then? What were some of your big takeaways? Um, I, I, I do have a question. I, and again, I want to echo Lauren's um, perspective. I, this is really helpful. I mean, it, particularly um, the ethics that are required to um, be uh, a, a high functioning board is really uh, impressed upon us. I, I, my follow up question along those lines is, you know, what are the consequences if board members violate those ethics? What, what sort of situations or what advice do you have for us if, if you find that um, there are member or members that, that don't live up to the standards that you've outlined in your presentation? Um, so either it, 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 it gets back to your towns. If there's a recall provision, uh, you might wanna address the town and saying, we have a board member who is consistently violating our policies, which basically is against the law because by law you're required to follow your policies. If there's no recall, um, then you, you can censor the person. Um, so they are, they can attend meetings, but they can be censored. And if they're appointed and they haven't been elected, that, that provides with a different avenue. If they're appointed and they have not been elected, you may go to your towns and say, this person is violating our school board policy. If this person is not willing to follow law. Therefore, can you unappoint and reappoint? And, and, you know, towns have little, every town has their little funny, you know, their own funny little you know things that they follow as well, but that would be those would be the three things that you could do. Censorship would be the most common. Do you mean censorship or censure? Censure. You censure. Did I say that wrong? Did I say it right, Carol? You say censor. Okay. Which is different. <laughs> You're right. Definition Chelsea. of censure. Um. I, sorry, Carol, that was amusing. Um, let me, let me refocus. Um, so, I'm, <laughs> so I'm chair of a new committee. And so I have a couple of questions um, about um, like agendas. And so we have public notice that we have to do for a board meeting. And I think I missed that piece, but my assumption is that there's a certain amount of time we have to publish information by, and there are certain good practices for like putting out agenda packets. Do those apply to committees? as well? Not legally, but um, I always did. I, okay. Because I just wanted to be transparent. So if we had a committee meeting, um, you know, it was a committee meeting and the public knew that, you know, if they wanted to listen in, they could. 
um, but they there's no public comment. So that's where that all stops. Um, there's no public comment. Uh, there's no, um, you're not gonna take a vote. Um, so you're gonna have a committee meeting. The public does not have the right to attend and to participate. But if you want people to know that you're meeting and you're doing this work, that's fine. You don't have to. Okay. And what are those public notice for the board since I missed that? Because I think that's a good practice to align with. Oh, John, what are you required? A week public notice? It's a week. I think it's a week for a regular meeting and right. there are lesser requirements for a special meeting and so on. But Three it's days actually, before you pick up the phone and you call the press. Right. Yeah. It's actually, it's in our policy somewhere. I don't have the policy in front of me, but yeah. Okay. I can look it up. And just for clarification, if people aren't aware, I'm chair of finance and facilities for the last couple of months. Yep. And we do notice our committee meetings as well. We do the same process. Is notice separate from an agenda? No, it's, an, well, the notice goes out with the agenda. Right. Policy that requires that we that all committee all subcommittee meetings be noticed. Policy does not. Policy pertains to just the board meetings. We cannot create a policy on on on. Uh, we, I, I said, can we create one? Not is there one in existence? Yes, you can create one. And then the other question I had. Um, so you talked earlier, Eileen, about. Um, the distinction between individuals requesting data and also the board requesting data. How does that work for committees? Um, so as a committee chair, if you need information from your superintendent to meet the items on the agenda, you absolutely will reach out and get that information. What, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want to have 10 individual board members constantly asking the superintendent for data-driven you know, for, for a variety for a, a variety of reports, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. that would consume all of his time answering to each individual board member. So if a report is required, is desired from the board level, it would come from a board meeting. So basically the board will have the discussion and say, well, John, could we get a report on this next time? So it's coming from one body, the board. If a subcommittee needs data to do their work, then absolutely you're going to reach out to John and you might CC John and reach out to the curriculum coordinator. I don't know how, you know, what your protocol is and, the, and how that all works, but um, you might want to just reach out to your, your, um, your curriculum coordinator, your assistant superintendent, and just say, I need this data on this, or you're going to reach out to your business manager on finance. Can you send me the spreadsheets on this? and just CC John so he knows. So whatever you've established is, is proper protocol for that, um, then I would continue to do that. But if you need that data to run a committee, to have a committee meeting, you absolutely need to have it, absolutely. Okay. And then my final question about that is, what is sort of best practices for creating agendas? Because again, we talked about that on the board level. Is that model sort of, um, I guess, funnel down to the committee level? So it depends on, on your, because if you're looking at finance, I would say that you and John and your business manager would be looking at what that subcommittee meeting, what, what, is, the, what is on the agenda? Why are you meeting? Uh, so talk about why you're meeting, talk about what, what information you're going to need, and then identify you know, what the three agenda items are. So I would be doing that with your superintendent, and I'd be doing that with your staff versus John doing agendas with Lauren for the entire board. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yep. And the good news is that is pretty much largely our practice. So I'm glad to hear that we've got some good protocols sure. in place. <laughs> and I didn't call John ahead of time to find out either. <laughs> any big takeaways, any ahas that you learned that you feel like, you know, I know it's uh, 6.43, um, so I don't wanna keep it any longer than we have to, but uh, is there any information that you feel will be helpful as you move forward as a board member? One question I have for you are, you know, meeting by uh, Zoom, you know, so we now have a policy like I think most school boards have, most, you know, most districts. Yeah. And like, for instance, uh, there was a meeting recently where I decided to move it to Zoom, but in, I, because I thought there would be a lot of people in a small room. So just in terms of COVID, I thought it'd be safer that way. And that could still happen. You know, I, I, I think we're doing well, but man, the numbers I saw today in Maine are, are pretty alarming and they might be for another month or two. So it looks like from our policy and statute that as board chair working with the superintendent, I can call 
like a Zoom meeting when I feel like it's the right thing to do. Yes. That could be a snowstorm in 20 years or next year, or it could be like COVID in two months, right? So is, that's accurate. Is that correct? Yeah. And I don't have your policy on remote where, uh, remote meeting uh, at all, but yes, you can, you can call a Zoom meeting, um, uh, and, but everyone has to be able to be seen. Everyone has right. to be not seen. Everyone has to be heard and you miss, they must be able to hear other people too. I don't have your policy in front of me uh, to really look at the language, but I'm assuming, John, it's the same policy that we all, that I sent out probably in July or August. It's, just, it's the same policy, right. Eileen. Yeah, so it does give you the authority to change a meeting, uh, but you must, you need to have a reason to do it. Um, I think, does yeah. that help, Warren? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think that that's something in my mind when I make sure we're doing it right in terms yeah. of statute, uh, that when we have a good reason, we do it. Okay. And I think yeah. it's a great ability now. I mean, it's just wonderful that we can... Um, like have a snow day, but we can still have a board meeting because we need to have a board meeting. Correct. That's and if a fantastic. board member is not physically able to make it due to a health reason or a business meeting, they can still attend a board meeting remotely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, that's that's also pretty yeah. big, especially for, you know, especially for the islands, um, some of those school island schools. Uh, this has been a right. huge, huge um, remote. What do you do about cats? How do you deal with cats? I, I mean, don't know. I've got three cats. I have like, three what is that? Labrador retrievers. Like the butt. It's like right there. What is that? Yeah. Move. Uh, if no one has any other questions. Um, them. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you, Eileen. Any other questions? Anybody else? Thank Go ahead, you, Eileen. We really appreciate I, it. I just wanted to thank Eileen. She did a great job. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. I hope it was helpful. And I'll, oh, very. Yeah, and I'll make sure I get that executive session information to you, Lauren. Great, wonderful. Thank you all. Else? Great to see you <laughs> tonight. You, Good to Have see you. Have a wonderful everyone. Uh, holiday. Happy Thanksgiving, Eat a lot of everyone. Bird. Stay safe, stuff, yeah. everyone. Have a good Thanksgiving. Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone.